Well, the Marx class and the class called the History of the Continental Tradition are classes that uh, I teach in areas that I do research in. And so they're always interesting to me because at uh, various points during the semester I'm lecturing about things that I'm, I'm working and writing about and doing research on at the moment. So those classes in particular are, are of interest to me. Most meaningful and inspirational to me? That's an interesting question. Um, hmm. And obviously you're construing cultural product rather broadly. Um, well, I would have to say, if I'm being honest, um, the technology uh, that I was raised in uh, probably has had the most profound effect on the way I experience the world and the way that I see the world. Um, obviously, beginning with media technologies, television, radio, now for the last 20 odd years or so we've had a little thing called the internet. It's on computers, if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, telephones, telecommunications technologies, uh, I grew up in a world, as, as did most of us who will be watching this probably, uh, where there was a TV set in the living room. For better or for worse, it was on, frequently. And um, that's a very different sort of world than, for example, my mother grew up in. Hence, the, the exposure that I've had to the world around me via technologies, to begin with media, things again like television and radio and the internet. Um, the exposure that I've had to the world via these technologies is very, very different than the exposure to the world that, for example, my mother had. Uh, she was born in 1932. She was born during the Depression, grew up during the Depression, grew up in a very, very poor part of Canada. I don't even think they had a radio when my mother was growing up. It's a little small town called Big Pond, population 250. I can remember when I was a kid, I can vividly remember, I guess I'm dating myself now, <clears throat> I can remember watching television reports from Vietnam, soldiers in Vietnam, watching it right in front of my face. I can recall listening to the radio, uh, getting ready to go to school in first grade, I can recall listening to the radio and listening to reports about the uh, Indo-Pakistani War, 1971. And of course, as I grew up, uh, I've been exposed constantly through television, through radio, through newspapers, through magazines, now through the internet, through the internet by means of which I can read newspapers from all over the world every single day, and I actually do. And this, this plethora of information that I've been exposed to from the time that I was this high means that clearly uh, it, it indicates that uh, I experience the world and I have perspectives on the world that are very different from people who grew up with different technologies. And different how, would you say? Well, uh, I would like to think that through the exposure that I've uh, experienced uh, from the time that I was a young child, I have a greater sense of, of the nature of the world around me um, than I would otherwise have had. Uh, research has shown us that, for example, in the Middle Ages, uh, the average individual, of course, was an agricultural worker. We would call them uh, peasant. I'm speaking about the, the European, the Western uh, historical context. And uh, estimates are that the average person uh, in the Middle Ages, say born in 1200, probably met a total of a couple hundred people during their entire life. When they were the only human beings that they came into contact, really in any way, shape, or form. Most people back then would have been literate. So even if there had been a newspaper floating around, they wouldn't have been able to read it and read about other lives or read books about other lives. Again, just to use the example of my mother, my mother um, didn't get on an airplane, to speak of another different kind of technology, uh, until she was uh, in her late 30s. Uh, 
I, we weren't rich when I grew up. I spent a lot of my life as a student, both as an undergraduate and as a graduate. And uh, students, not really people of significant financial means. But even though I've led my entire life, even now as a professor, professors, we, we don't starve, but well, it's not like other professions. We don't make the same kind of money that a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist is going to make. We're comfortable, but we're people of pretty modest means. So although I've led my entire life um, in situations of modest financial means, I've still had the opportunity to travel all around North America, been to pretty much every large city on the North American continent. I've traveled extensively through Europe. And again, this is these are, are avenues of exposure to the world around me that, that were not even available to my own mother, let alone to people hundreds of years ago. So I think, um, as far as cultural products are concerned, once again, the various technologies that are characteristic of, of the world that I grew up in have served to form my view and my perspective on the world probably more than anything else, more than any single book that I've read or philosophy that I've been exposed to simply because it's been there all around me since I was a child. The radio's been on, the TV's been on in the corner, there have been magazines and newspapers on the coffee table. Well, I think for better and probably for worse as well, growing up in the day and age that I grew up in, and we should add, of course, the fact that it's not just the time period, the late 20th century that I grew up in, it's also the fact that although myself and my family we have always been people of modest means, I grew up in an affluent country. I grew up in Canada. And even someone, once again, of modest means, growing up in an affluent nation like Canada or the United States, European countries, we have all of these opportunities, all of these technological instruments and devices are available to us, even if we're kind of poor like I was. Um, so I think for better or for worse, um, someone who grew up with these technologies all around them is going to have a broader perspective on the world, uh, a broader focus vis-a-vis -vis what is important, what is significant, what is meaningful than someone, once again, who lived their entire life not traveling more than a few miles away from the place they were born and, and meeting only a few dozen or a couple of hundred people during their entire lives. One could and obviously did rich, live rich, fulfilling lives back then, but they were fundamentally different. They were more narrowly focused. The world that people grew up in, in 12th and in the Middle Ages, the world that my mother grew up in is a smaller place. It's a smaller place for better and or for worse than the world that I grew up in. What motivates me to teach? Well, I think like most people that find themselves at a certain point of their life stumbling into uh, academia and bumbling their way through to become a professor, most of us end up doing that not because we think we're going to make a lot of money, because we don't, but we end up choosing this career path because we have a genuine fascination and love for what it is that we are studying. In my case, it's philosophy. So it's, it's you know, when you love something, when it fascinates you, generally you want to share it with other people. You want to communicate it with to other people. And uh, being in a classroom is a fantastic way of doing it. So in the first instance, it's, it's the love of, of the figures and the texts that I read uh, and the courses that I teach that, that is the prime motivation. Like any subject, like mathematics or geology or anthropology, not everybody in my classrooms is going to end up sharing my enthusiasm for the subject, and that's fine. That's fine. But happily, uh, in pretty much every class I teach, well, not in pretty much, in every class that I teach, there's going to be a population of people, and happily, it's generally a good chunk who, who do develop an interest in the topic. They may not go on to pursue a career in philosophy. They may not even ever take another philosophy class. But in the class that I happen to be teaching, um, something or some text or the entire subject matter of the course draws them in. They get excited and interested in it. And um, they respond to, to hopefully the energy and the interest that I expressed in the material. And, and seeing students get hooked on 
various texts or figures or, or becoming interested in various issues that were examining in a class. That's always uh, uh, part of what makes being in the classroom fun and exciting and interesting. Off the top of my head, I would have to say, to begin with, the person who I have done the most work on, the most research on, uh, written the most about, a guy by the name of Martin Heidegger, who is a 20th century philosopher, uh, died in 1976 in philosophical terms, of course, it's pretty recently. I was still alive. I was still alive. Heidegger was still alive uh, during my lifetime, so that makes him a contemporary figure. Uh, Heidegger being the person that, that I do the greatest amount of work on, that I do the most amount of research on, is probably the person who has influenced my own philosophical perspective to the greatest extent. Um, How so? Well, Heidegger, the most interesting, he's, he's a very rich thinker. His uh, collected works, many shelves, many bookshelves in the library. Uh, what I find most interesting and compelling about Heidegger's work is his uh, uh, analysis of what he refers to as das Sein. It's a German word. It's two German words stuck together, da and sein. Dot means there, sein means being. So in, in English, this, this German word das Sein is usually translated as being with a hyphen there. And that's Heidegger's designation for, for what it means to be a human being. To be a human being means to be das sein, it means to be being there. And in Heidegger's perspective, we as human beings are not hermetically sealed consciousnesses set off against this, this world that is outside of us, that we experience through our eyes and through our ears, etc. Rather, a part of who we are is what we might call the environment within which we live. The environment within which we are maneuvering around during the course of our everyday lives. That is a part of our identity. And Heidegger's thinking of what that means and, and how our environment forms our very identity, uh, I find really interesting and fascinating. Just for one example, uh, insofar as we are being there, one of the facts about what we are, on Heidegger's view, is the notion that we are always attuned to the world around us in various ways. And one way that we might translate the German language, that uh, the German terms that Heidegger is making use of in order to describe this, is to say that we always have a particular mood that sort of colors the world around us and through which we experience our there, our environment, our world. For example, and I'm just again using some examples from Heidegger's work, we are attuned to the world through the mood of anxiety at certain points of our lives, through joy, through awe, through boredom. And uh, it's this aspect in particular, this aspect of his analysis of, of what das sein is, what it means to be there in the world, that, that uh, I find most rich and interesting and compelling about the work of Heidegger. Well, I don't think, uh, certainly I am not, but I don't think Heidegger is suggesting that our environment is the only thing that forms our identity. I think he is saying, and other people say this, and, and I am um, in agreement with the notion that we are, part of who and what we are, is a product of the world within which we were born and raised. But I also agree with um, the thinking of another great uh, historical philosopher from uh, a figure from Greek classical antiquity, Aristotle, who most people have probably heard of. Um, Aristotle believes that most people are born with particular, again, the, the word that we would use to, to translate the ancient Greek here would probably be disposition, dispositions. People are born with 
dispositions. And uh, it, it's funny, uh, uh, a couple of friends of mine uh, have recently, within the last year, had babies. Both of them for the first time. And th these are friends of mine that I've made through the philosophical world, so they're philosophers. And it's hilarious. Neither of these individuals works in ancient philosophy, does research on Aristotle, but we all, you know, insofar as we have PhDs, we know a little bit about the great figures in the Western philosophical tradition. Both of them reported separately to me that just the experience of raising, beginning the, the long process of raising their child from infancy, it's experiencing the first few days of their child's life has shown them that there really is some kind of identity there. Even in an infant a few days old, there are dispositions, to use Aristotle's term. Some infants are cranky. They just have that disposition. Others spend apparently most of their waking time staring off in the world in what seems like amazement. And so I, I, I think that um, Aristotle is right, that we do have various dispositions that we're born with, but Aristotle says these dis dispositions can be changed, trained, and altered on the basis of, of habitual practices, habitual practices that, that are a product of our education, of our family, the, the, uh, the training that we received beginning with our, our, our parents. So I guess really you're asking the question about the distinction between nature and nurture, yes? Yeah, to some extent. Uh, but even if uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna even cop if both out are involved, and, right? Both are involved. I think it's clearly the case. Uh, I, and I agree. I think that's right. Uh, what I wonder is, is our our nature, or sorry, our, yeah, our uh, nurture, our environment, uh, being so uh, predominantly uh, um, two dimensional images are a major part of mm -hmm. our environment now mm -hmm. in a way they never were before. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what the impact of that is. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, interestingly, Heidegger, uh, a, a, another very important aspect of, of Heidegger's work, uh, in particular the work that he started doing uh, after the Second World War, the late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, um, focused upon the effects of technology on our experience and on our thinking. And of course he's writing in the context of the mid to late 20th century, a world in which technological innovations are coming fast and furious, mm -hmm. a world in which when Heidegger is a young man, maybe there's a radio in somebody's house, maybe not in the village, by the time He's a mature professor of philosophy. Everybody's got a TV. Everybody's tuned into the world via the TV and, and can see two-dimensional images of people halfway across the globe in an instant at the turn of a dial, literally, now at the press of a button. Heidegger worried, and one of the things that Heidegger worried about this sort of transformation was that it may serve to inculcate within us a false sense that we have a real grasp and understanding of the lives that other people lead in the neighborhood a few blocks away, in a town on the other side of the country, and a village literally on the other side of the world. And Heidegger believes that by means of these flickering two-dimensional images, or even a few paragraphs in a newspaper, we are probably getting a very, very superficial sense of the lives that these real, living, breathing human beings are actually leading. And we're doing ourselves, and perhaps in some circumstances, them, we're doing them and ourselves a disservice if we think that we are gaining some kind of profound access to the actual lives that they, were, that they are leading. Does and, that mean and Heidegger thought that there was a serious danger in that. Does that mean that our self-image is impacted and is more shallow than it should otherwise be? Or would otherwise be? Well, I think our self-image insofar as we may 
fall victim to uh, believing ourselves to, to have a certain kind of awareness, privileged awareness of the world around us and what is going on, then I think there is also the danger, and I believe Heidegger would agree with me on this, whether he does or doesn't is beside the point, um, that this can lead to a false conception of oneself. A false conception in this instance is someone who has greater knowledge of, greater wisdom about the world than we really do. And this is something that, well, the first great figure in, in the Western philosophical tradition, a guy by the name of Socrates, most people have probably heard of, this is something that Socrates worried about his entire life. This was perhaps the main concern that motivated all of Socrates' philosophical dialogue, discussion, and inquiry. This concern that he had about whether or not people thought that they were smarter than they really were. Mm -hmm. Socrates, you probably know, is famous for, among other things, saying, I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing at all. And Socrates came to believe that that made him, as the Oracle of Delphi reported during his life, that made him the wisest person in the city of Athens, mm -hmm. according to the god Apollo. Socrates came to believe that what the god Apollo meant when he told Socrates' friend Chirophon that Socrates, no one was wiser than Socrates, what the god meant was that he is wise who recognizes and understands their own ignorance. And I think that's um, a philosophical aphorism that is as valuable today in, in the contemporary context, perhaps even more so today, in this world that we, wherein we think that we have access to everything that's going on at every point of the globe. I think it's, uh, it's an aphorism that is, is even more valuable today than it was 2,500 years ago. Nice. You know what Andy Warhol said about, um, he said um, two things that are, are of interest. He uh, said, Pierre, your 15 minutes is nearly up. Yeah, your 15 for one minutes thing. of fame is over. No. <laughs> uh, he said, Turn off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, he, said that, uh, he said that people don't know how to feel anymore. People don't know how to feel anymore, and that the reason they don't know how to feel, feel anymore is because of movies. Yeah, that's how that's what started it, and then TV continued the problem. And then the second thing that he said is, all my life I felt like I was sort of half living, uh, not quite alive, not totally, not fully living. And then when I got shot, uh, I knew. Oh no, no, sorry. Like I was watching TV. Like I was watching TV. And then when I got shot, I knew I was watching TV. That's very interesting. There's a. There's a very interesting connection between that story that you just told about Andy Warhol and uh, a short essay that was written about, oh gosh, how many years ago would it be? About seven or eight years ago by a, a pretty famous contemporary philosopher, a guy by the name of, he's a Slovenian, his name is Slavoj Žižek. <laughs> and Žižek, uh, again, about seven or eight years ago, wrote, the occasion was the death of, I can't remember the person's name, but it was the person who invented the laugh track. Mm -hmm. that is used in, in sitcoms. Mm -hmm. And the, the title of this piece that was occasioned by this, this person's death was Please Laugh for Me. And part of Zizek's point in this short little uh, article that he wrote for, for a, a popular journal, not for a philosophical journal, was, was the notion that by means of various technologies, like for example, most obviously television, cinema, film, not only do we live in a world in which other people act for us, other people live lives for us. We experience life vicariously through other people acting on television screens, on um, movie screens. Not only is that part of the world that we live in, but now other people not just live for us, but other people feel for us. The people who laugh on the laugh track of the sitcom are experiencing the humor for us. Wow. And we've been relegated to this, this position of a completely, completely passive observer of the world around us.